Hey, everybody, it is the Drive to School podcast. This is a special episode because there's lots of people here. I'm Pastor Goodman, and uh, joining me is a whole bunch of HT people. We're going to tackle a tough one today, so I wanted some help. Uh, We've got uh, Erica Jacoby, the Executive Director of Higher Things. We have Kristen Sanchez, the Events Executive, and Rhonda Palazzari. She is our Communications Executive. Uh, But more important than all of that, uh, they're saints in the church. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, morning, Pastor Goodman. How's it going? You said we were saints. <laughs> you are. This is an important thing. Um, we're, we're doing this thing based on, on baptism because the thing that we're tackling today um, is, is hurt in the church. Um, it, it's, it's trauma in the church. It, it's even hurt by the church. Um, and, and so it's one of those, those things that um, despite what uh, everybody sort of wants to believe in the church, defying all reason at large, is that if you pack a whole bunch of sinners into a box, but we put a cross on the top, they're not going to sin against each other and nothing bad can happen. Um, <laughs> in, in reality, <laughs> you pack a whole bunch of sinners into a box and, and they sin against each other um, and, and sin it, it breaks stuff. It, it truly and genuinely hurts. That happens not only sort of um, within sort of the, the, the congregations, uh, but that also happens um, amongst leadership, amongst clergy, because, well, we're, we're sinners too. Um, we're, we're desperately in need of mercy too. And the amount of hurt that can be caused when somebody who has a different power dynamic, a greater power dynamic, it, it, it increases the hurt by, by um, Goodman, as you magnitudes. were talking about that, it occurred to me, you could say the exact same thing about families, what you yeah. just said. That's, that's absolutely true. Um, it it might be some make up the church too. A lot of times. Yeah. I mean, I mean, we call each other brothers and sisters in Christ. Mm-hmm. Um, and this, this actually is, is a thing where like, we we're not Roman Catholics, so we don't call our, our pastor's father. Uh, but Paul uses the term. Um, and so it's not a, a wrong term, uh, but, but it also starts to show that, that there is, there's, there's a power dynamic in the church too. So that when, when the pastor sins, when the father sins, it, it can hurt. Um, it, this can be a place where, where we can, we can tell a little story. This can be a place where we just sort of recognize that, that all of us have been through some kind of trauma or another, both the things that we have done wrong as sinners and, and the things that have been wrong to us. So where does this leave you? feeling first and foremost, because it's, it's important to acknowledge this. It's a, it's a fearful feeling all of a sudden, you know, you're in this place that's supposed to be a place of safety. You're in a place that's supposed to be a place of refuge and respite. And all of a sudden, um, or, you know, little by little over the course of years, you start to find yourself not feeling safe there and not finding the things that you need to find there. And that can cause a crisis that can cause, a, um, a wondering of where do I go now? What am I supposed to do? This is supposed to be the place where I find my wholeness and I'm not finding that right now. I think also these situations can occur when there is a crisis of some kind um, and your, your expectation is to be um, maybe loved and cared for by your church family. Um, and to be honest, when we're in crisis, we're frequently an emotional, psychological, spiritual mess. Um, and, uh, um, you know, people don't always know, even pastors, um, people in your congregation don't always know the best thing to say or the best thing to do. Um, I mean, you can feel, I mean, the story of the good Samaritan makes me think of the story of the good Samaritan. You can feel like the person bleeding in the side of the ditch and people are just passing you by. Um, and you don't understand why. And you, you probably expect, um, if you're part of that church family, um, that that wouldn't happen to you. So it, it can be incredibly painful, particularly going through a crisis. Um, and like Kristen said, sometimes it, it can be just sort of a lifelong thing um, that causes the crisis uh, or the crisis of faith. Um, I think either or both can happen to people. I think also, just like with mental health, it's not discussed about uh, all that frequently, um, that we'd rather not talk about it. It's a thing that's pushed into the corner and we don't want to discuss it because it may be hard to discuss. It may be hard to admit that these things happen in the church, but they do. And just like we are shining a light on mental health, we need to shine a light on these things as well um, because there is still grace and still um, we still have uh, Christ as our leader and uh, there's healing but we have to talk about it in order for there to be healing. 
Right. I think the people who are willing to talk about it the most are the ones who have left the church. And and for us, it's it's an embarrassing thing because we're left sort of trying to gauge people's intentions um, because it's really hard to feel like people have the best of intentions when they're passing you by on the side of the road. But even if they do, um, there's still the hurt that that needs to be discussed in, in, inside of the church. And, and when we do this, we, we want Christ to be our leader and not sinners because, well, Christ, like we, we just have to say it, Christ would do a better job of this. Mm -hmm. We have to be able to say that as, as pastors, as brothers and sisters in Christ, if Jesus were here, I'm sure he would have done a better job with this. So that the first sort of stance that we need to take inside of this isn't just that there should be a church, but it's, it's, we in the church desperately, desperately need mercy. I think too, that, um, you know, we're all so touchy about, about it, but let's, let's be quite honest, um, because we're sinful beings, we are hypocrites. And nobody likes our hypocrisy being pointed out. Um, and that includes the church. That includes leadership in the church. Um, and, and I think that's why folks outside the church are, you know, oftentimes so frustrated with, with talking about it because um, I think the response from inside the church at times is one of defense um, instead of one of apology and acknowledgement of our own sinful natures and our own shortcomings. Um, and when we do that, we're still pointing to ourselves. We're being hypocrites. We're not pointing to Christ. We're not um, pointing to the one who forgives all and, and, um, and who died for all of these sins, including our sins of hypocrisy, including those where we've failed one another in the church, where the church has failed others. Um, and Christ died for that church, the whole church. Um, and so that kind of has to be the message. We have to point back to Christ rather than to ourselves and our defensiveness and, and how we've fallen short. And I really think that that message would be so helpful to those that are now outside the church um, and kind of going, why? Well, because we um, we live in this culture, whether it's social media or whatever, where it's the facade that we put up. It's the, it's the way that we make ourselves look to those around us um, as families, as people, all those things. But then as a congregation, as a church, outward facing as well and in this concept of like outreach or whatever. And if we don't look like we actually need Jesus, that's what that's what we're trying to do. And, and that puts us in this posture of not actually needing the thing that we claim to be the place where people go when they actually need it. And so we set ourselves up to fail as, as a church when we don't actually show that we're relying on the thing that we claim we need. We do actually need. Right. But there's a, there's this posture among Christianity where it, it's okay to need Jesus to be better, but it's not okay to need Jesus because you're bad. You know what I mean? So, so like I, the, the, the small sins are, are the ones we, we talk about in the church, but, but more than that, that we, we talk about a Jesus who helps us improve, not about a Jesus who helps us deal with utter disaster, catastrophe, wounds, um, abuse, neglect, uh, trauma, um, and, and all of the forms that they take. When, when we start to talk about those things, uh, it just, it gets so dark so quick that, that, um, it, it leaves a, a tone of hopelessness very quickly as, as the one that starts to rule the day, even while we, we desperately want to find hope in, in our savior. Mm -hmm. There are, I think, a couple of pitfalls when it comes to this, especially with the really, really painful stuff. Um, it, when, when it comes to, to abuse, when it comes to, to um, the, the sexual sins that happen in the church, when it comes to, to the awfulest of, of things, uh, the devil takes advantage of this. Like we, we have to recognize this is where the devil will, will work very hard to destroy faith, to, to attack souls. And he tends to do things by pushing these, these, these beliefs that we have to the extremes to where they, they don't apply anymore. So we, we can say that what happened is terrible. And the devil will push on this to say that this is so terrible that I, I don't know how this could actually be forgiven. We actually want to take a stance that abuse in the church is so wrong that, that there is no excuse for it. There is no place for it. There is no room for it at all. And we start to eventually corner ourselves ourselves into saying, this thing, if you did this thing in the church, you got to go. There's no forgiveness for you here. There is no welcome for you here anymore. You cannot be here. You're talking uh, about being canceled in the church. Is the I, church cancel? Yeah. Right. Um, I, I mean, we have a word excommunication for it, but even this is sort mm -hmm. of done with the desire that ultimately you would you would recognize that you need forgiveness and receive forgiveness. But this canceling, it, it, it's more saying, 
if you want to be a Christian, it's never going to be here uh, because what you have done is is not forgivable. And we recognize uh, on a simple, you know, Jesus died for everybody kind of scale that this this isn't true. But when when it's actually you who hurts this bad, it's harder to feel this. But there's this really dark thing that happens from it. It's not just sort of the, the idea that that you would start to, to sort of say Jesus didn't die for everybody, but, but it, it sort of gets worse. If Jesus won't draw near to something that profane, something that unclean, something that wrong to forgive a sinner, then eventually you you start to imagine a Jesus who won't draw near to the people who have been made that dirty either, made that unclean, that the people who have experienced that kind of, of, of sin uh, against them are, are harder, they, they find it hard to find identity in Christ there because it's simply, those are the things that Jesus will have nothing to do with. And it leaves us in a place where we cannot talk about these things as if there is mercy, not for the people who, who need it, but also not for the people who, who need it because they've been sinned against. It's really hard to step back into a church when you've been so badly hurt, but that's when I find that I need it the most. That's when I need Jesus the most. And to recognize that even when it's a pastor hurting you, that there's a difference between the pastor uh, before he steps on the altar and when he steps on the altar, because when he steps on the altar, that is when he is the mouthpiece of God. And the words that are spoken to me are from Christ. And so I need those words from Christ. I need that healing. And so even when I know uh, the words that have hurt me from that person are different from the words that are healing from the altar. And it is difficult. And tears were streaming down my face being in the church, uh, knowing that different people have hurt, but it also healed. And it's not an easy step, but running away from it, I've seen people run away. And we've, because um, being a church worker, I've seen people run away and you mourn for them. You, you miss them. You, you want to be there. You want to talk about it, but they're hurt too. And I, I, I've seen too many people run away that it, it, they're not healed either. And I don't want to be in that place where I'm stuck in that loop either. Well, and there's a strength and a grit that comes with you being able to walk in back into the church like that. And there's a lot of people who have been hurt significantly enough that they aren't to that point. And shame on the institutions for causing that to happen. Um, but thanks be to God for the congregations who are are open and willing and and a welcoming place for people who are struggling like that who can and walk in and find the gifts because that's it it's where can they find forgiveness and comfort and balm for their healing um because not everybody has that same grit and strength no and i couldn't do it alone and it not necessarily that the uh institution was welcoming um but the people necessarily were um, and that's the whole thing too, with like church where, you know, you see people like, these are my family, right? You hear that all the time. And uh, I think knowing that, and also knowing whose house it is, right? It's not, mm-hmm. it's not one person, one pastor, one this, it's whose ultimate house it is. Um, mm-hmm. And that's what draws me back because uh, Pastor Goodman, you hit on it uh, before uh, when you said, um, I just lost my train of thought, but Christ, it, it being Christ, it's all back to Christ. Right. Pastor Goodman, I'd like to, cl- I'd like to ask you kind of a clarifying question or make a clarification because we're all adults here. Um, and so we have a bit more autonomy than perhaps a youth would have. And, you know, we talk to youth, um, and I am aware even of my own children and children that I've served, um, you know, as a, as a youth leader, um, that perhaps have some of these same issues, um, maybe with their pastor or with their church. Um, it's it, it can potentially be easy for an adult to maybe go to a different church if that if they're that hurt, or to maybe just not go to church. But if I'm uh, if if I'm a if I'm a kid, um, sometimes I have to like I have to go. I, I you know, and I I don't have the option of going elsewhere, or I don't have the option of not going. Um, what sort of comfort or words can we can we say to youth in those circumstances? Because um, they're sort of they don't have the autonomy at this point. Um, right. What can they do? Um, this is this is one of those places where we, we get to recognize first that there there's a lot of nuance. Um, but 
inside of all of it though there there's sort of at least in our churches there's a liturgy that this sort of captures all of it uh the, the first thing that everybody does when we start church is, is confession and absolution and we we recognize that that um there are there there's not a single person there who is there because they are good enough that luther said that the life of the christian is one of repentance and anybody who says that well yeah my life was repentance and now it's better or it needs to just get better and stop being repentance and just get better it, it takes away from forgiveness there are also those those sins that that keep happening and those are the ones that, that need to be addressed in, in light of the, the Christian community um, that, that talk to your parents um, a, a about what's happening right. and talk to them in light of, uh, again, you are not less for being sinned against. Uh, you are holy. You are worthy of love because you are baptized. And, and so the thing then that, that we have is, is we have sin and we want enemies. Um, and when we, we, we go looking for enemies inside of the church, the devil will point at every other sinner there and sometimes ourselves. Um, and again, we start to, to wrestle with what was the intention? Um, is, it, is, is it something that, that um, somebody fell into sin or is it something that, that there was just evil there that they wanted to be evil? Um, and, and how we address it, again, it, it's, it's one of those pitfalls the devil kind of pushes us in. Um, so we, we recognize that, that it's wrong to say that there's no forgiveness here, but that there's also the pitfall of sort of recognizing that, um, well, we, we start to, to say that forgiveness is so important that, that we take forgiveness to be our justification rather than Jesus. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is um, in the same way, we can't have faith in our faith. Like you don't say, well, I know that I'm going to heaven because I believe you say, I know that I'm going to heaven because Jesus rose from the dead, because that, that matters on those days where you find it hard to believe the days where you sort of say, I trust in my forgiveness rather than I trust in my savior who forgives are the days where you start to, to say, well, as long as there's forgiveness, why should there still be hurt? If there is, if there really is forgiveness, you, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be bothered by this. If there really is forgiveness, then, then no, there nobody nobody's allowed to to sort of talk about it as if it actually needs to be addressed um and, and the reality is sin breaks stuff and and some things this side of glory they break to the point where they can't be fixed uh, yeah so in the resurrection there to, will be but just to clarify again i think what you're saying is you know we have the ten commandments and it is we're not saying that sin in the church is excused because we're sinners no. um if you are being sinned against and like I said, you have, you, we, we have the 10 commandments. You, you can tell pretty easily from those when you're sinned against by another person, um, you have your parents or potentially you have your pastor to talk to, and you should, you can and should do that it is not okay, um, for anyone in the church to be sinning against you. Um, I, I just wanted to restate that again, that yeah, we are not saying here, we are acknowledging there is sin in the church. And that leadership in the church can be less than perfect at times, but we are not saying that that is okay. Leadership that in the church be can be a sinner and it's not okay. It's yeah. not okay for your pastor to sin against you. It's not okay for your elders, for your youth group, for, for the other people in your church to sin against you. It's, it's not okay. It is mm -hmm. something that Jesus died for. And, and what that looks like going forward then, it, it's what shapes the church because we desperately want just a nice bow to put on something that looks this messy. And we can say, well, everybody found a way to make up and now there's no more hurt or everybody sort of dealt with their, their well, we heard the forgiveness. So why are you still hurt by it? Um, or, 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 well, let's, let's just find a different church where there's not sinners in here. And, and then now that we have the autonomy to leave and go somewhere else, things will just be better and nothing bad can happen again. And in all of it, the church, this side of glory is filled with sinners that do disgusting, awful things. But uh, the Lord church has mercy. the gifts and we need the gifts. Church is where you gather around the things that are going to fix that. Exactly yeah. right. It gives us, well, that's what we need that hope. Yeah. yeah we, we need that. Need that. We, not just the hope, but the things that the hope are, that, that, that the hope can that be found. I, I need a baptism. I need a Lord's That's Supper. Right. I need a Jesus that is preached to me, even if it happens to be done by mm -hmm. a sinner. The reason that um, any of us still go to church at, at all is not because we have found a place where we all just get along, but it's because there is actually the cure to the thing that is killing us in this place that doesn't feel safe. Um, I, I think sort of the imagery that, that our Lord would, would use for the church is helpful for here because we, we paint pictures of churches as if they are just sort of bright communities of uh, brothers mm -hmm. and sisters in Christ in sort of this nice Midwestern way where everybody gets along or at least doesn't fight in public. Um, but Jesus talks about the church as being built up against the gates of hell. Mm -hmm. What does this mean? When, when uh, the, the psalmist, the 23rd Psalm, that's a church psalm. He says there, there's a, 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 a table surrounded by my enemies. Then, and on it, there's a chalice that runneth over. 
he's talking about your altar with communion on it. And where is it put? It's surrounded by enemies in the valley of the shadow of death. This is where God builds his churches. And this is who God builds his churches for. It, it's, it's for the people who need it. It's an ark in the midst of the flood. The flood mm -hmm. is happening all around us. And so we gather in the ark of the church that holds it's us. Your, it's your lifeline. Yeah. 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 So in the church, then sin needs to die and, and sinners need to die so that they can rise with Christ. This isn't sort of found again in just making better choices, although we're going to strive to because sin hurts so bad that you cannot just ignore it or pretend, well, if it's forgiven, don't worry about it. It's not okay. And sometimes you might even need to be away from a certain sinner who hurt you in this way for a while and recognize that Jesus is going to have to be the one to carry them until the resurrection. Yeah. But in all of it, uh, the, the thing that, that matters um, is not the individual congregation, but it's the gifts given there. It, go to a, a church where your sins can be forgiven and recognize that Jesus forgives the whole world there. And, and that forgiveness is ugly. And it's, it's, it's so painful that, that you can look at a picture of a crucifix and say, that's how much it hurt for forgiveness. It, it's not supposed to be a clean thing. It's not supposed to just make everything better. There were three days in the tomb where, where everybody thought everything was awful, but there was forgiveness. That's where we live this side of the resurrection. It, it, it's chaos. It, it's ugly. People are sinning against each other. So did Christ rise and will we, this, this ultimately is the thing that sustains the church. And, and that, that makes a different kind of hope um, that that's not sort of rooted in building a perfect community, but in, in Christ dealing with the people who are set against each other in, in mercy in forgiveness so that eventually we can all look at ourselves as the ones that have been forgiven by Christ and strive then to love the ones that have been put in front of us as if they're worth that love too. Thanks be to God. It's not a hopeful way that, that we sort of talk about it in a cheerful way, but it's a hopeful way that, that lets us sort of talk about this institution um, as if it's not just an institution by men that needs to exist because we need another institution for some reason, but because there is a place where God wants to be amongst all of the ugly in the world. And that's on the cross. And there is a place where God wants to be among all of the, the ugly in the world. And that's, that's in your congregation where the word is preached to you and the sacraments are given to you. The reason we have a church is because it looks this way. And, and quite frankly, not having a church, you still have all the same kind of sinners. It's just you're trying to hide from them as opposed to actually have Jesus confront them in forgiveness and mercy that we can, again, strive to be more. Any kind of closing thoughts here? Or what do you think? No, I think you covered it there, Pastor. <laughs> I have nothing to add to that. All right. Well, um, the... The end times uh, are when we're recording this, not just that and these are the dark and latter days, but this is the end of the church here. Um, and, and this is where the texts get all kind of end of the worldy, mm -hmm. um, which is, is maybe a, a really good time to record this uh, because it, it's questions about who's in and who's out. And we, we, we can't mark this by works. We have to mark this by gift, by, by Jesus forgiving the sinners who don't deserve forgiveness and yeah. Jesus gathering in the ones who have been wounded to the point where they cannot claw their way up to the, the kingdom of God. It's Jesus saving sinners, but, but more, it, it's a chance to recognize just how hectic and how scattered it is. When, when we record this, this is when things are falling apart and the steeples look like they're crumbling and the word is still preached and Christ is still risen. And until he returns in the last great day, we, we get to join with the church of old and just say, come Lord Jesus, because I want more than just another institution. I want the resurrection. Amen. Amen. It's the drive to school. Thanks for tuning in. <laughs>